I think we are all trying to see through the fog of war of what's really going on over in Israel, the reaction here in the United States. Uh, to help me better understand that, I have uh, journalist Joel Pollack with me from Breitbart News. Joel, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. It's good to be with you. So you're just now returning from Israel. You've been over there, uh, boots on the ground, uh, assessing the situation, writing about the situation. Uh, what, is, what is the mood like over there as you go from town to town and interact with the people? Well, as you go about Israel, the mood of patriotism is overwhelming. And there are flags everywhere flying from everyone's apartment balconies, public buildings. There's an incredible spirit of togetherness and unity. People are very upset about what happened. There's a scar that's going to be in the heart of the Israeli people for a long time over this, for generations, really, because that's the scale of this terror attack and the brutality and atrocity of it. But there's also a sense of determination that people are helping each other out. People are going to war if their reserve units are called up. In fact, some of the reserve units have had more people show up then we're actually invited or called up because people simply want to fight. They want to make sure this never happens again. So there's a real determination and a spirit of togetherness that's unlike anything I've ever seen or witnessed anywhere in the world. Okay. Uh, late last night on Thanksgiving, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced that he had ordered Mossad to basically take out any Hamas leader regardless of where they were on planet Earth. Do you think that this is a good strategy? Is this going to actually get to the heart of removing Hamas out of Palestine? Well, first of all, the Hamas leadership doesn't live anywhere near the Palestinian areas. Most of them live in Qatar or in Turkey, and many of them are billionaires. So when you see true stories of poverty in Gaza, remember that Ismail Haniya, the leader of Hamas, is worth multiple billions of dollars. He's become rich by exploiting the process of importing and exporting goods from Gaza. He's invested in real estate. He's got all kinds of other holdings. And this is true of all the senior leadership of Hamas. They've become billionaires on the backs of the struggle of fellow Palestinians who they then send to war. And when the Israelis respond to defend their own people, then these leaders of Hamas say that Israel is terrible and so forth. Meanwhile, they just live in luxurious exile. They're all marked for death. Israel will kill all of them the way it did the Palestinian terrorists who carried out the Munich Olympic massacre back in 1972. For those who have studied this period of history or lived through it, Palestinian gunmen abducted Israeli athletes from the Summer Olympic Games in Munich, Germany. And the West Germans bungled an attempt to intercept the hostage takers and the hostages as they were at the airport. And so the Palestinian terrorists murdered all of the Israeli hostages. In response, Israel, under then Prime Minister Golda Meir, vowed that there was going to be an effort to kill all of the Palestinian terrorists responsible in uh, this attack. And she did so. The Israeli intelligence services did so. There was one case that was revived recently because one of the planners of the attack was hiding in Beirut, in Lebanon. And an Israeli soldier named Ehud Barak, who would later go on to be elected prime minister of Israel, he went undercover into Beirut and he killed this terrorist. And the grandson of that terrorist is actually a Democrat who ran for Congress unsuccessfully a couple of times here in Southern California. And it came out that he was the grandson of this terrorist who had been killed by Israel in retaliation for his role in the Munich massacre. But Israel can and will deliver on that threat. And I would assume that the leadership of Hamas is going to be removed in some fashion or another over the next several years. It's not going to happen right away, but I think that Israel has shown an ability to deliver on those threats in the past. And 
we in the United States need to consider what that means for our interests, because Qatar, which is where most of these leaders are hiding out, is also the host country to a major U.S. military installation, to a couple of them, actually. So we have to rethink our relationship with some of these countries. We also have to rethink our foreign policy. There's no way this attack on October 7th would have happened if Joe Biden and the Biden administration hadn't emboldened Iran, hadn't emboldened Hamas. None of this ever happened under Donald Trump. And you can like Donald Trump or hate Donald Trump. But the fact is, for four years, Vladimir Putin didn't invade anybody and Hamas terrorists didn't launch any wars against Israel. So we've learned now through a comparison of policies, which policy makes the most sense. Is it peace through strength, which is the Ronald Reagan, Donald Trump approach? Or is it peace through appeasement, trying to get along with everybody, trying to make deals with people who say death to America, sending money overseas to countries that don't necessarily spend it wisely and conflicts that they refuse to resolve diplomatically? That's the Biden approach. And we can see the result. Yeah. Um, isn't uh, Qatar the one holding the the five billion dollars that that the Biden administration released to Iran? Yes, Qatar has set itself up as a kind of middleman between the West and some of these rogue states and regimes. And it has to be told that it has to make a choice now between peace and prosperity with the West on the one hand, or war and self-destruction with Iran and with Russia and China on the other. Unfortunately, the Biden foreign policy has been tough where it should have been diplomatic and diplomatic where it should have been tough. And he tried his best to be nice to Russia. Then Russia invaded Ukraine and Biden then slapped all these sanctions on Russia and drove Russia into the arms of the Chinese. So now we confront a united opposition to America on the world stage with Russia and China teaming up with Iran. In my view, there's no way that Russia wasn't advising Iran and through Iran, some of the Hamas terrorists, because of the style of attack that we saw on October 7th, they used drones, for example, to take out Israeli army observation posts using techniques similar to those the Russian military has used in Ukraine. They knew uh, certain things about Israeli bases that really couldn't have been known by Hamas intelligence on its own. So I think Russia has been playing a role. Russia plays a dual role. It's not that Russia is our implacable enemy. Russia has some common interest with the United States. And Russia doesn't want to see Israel destroyed. But Russia does want to see both the United States and Israel weakened. And that's why it's working with our enemies. Trump made clear there would be a consequence for doing that. Biden has not made that clear, except when it was too late. And we need a rethink of our foreign policy. And whoever you're voting for in 2024, clearly going down the path we're on right now does not work. Yeah. So on 9-11, on Biden announces we're going to release $5 billion to Iran. Less than 30 days later, they're, they're, in, they're emboldened, Hamas is emboldened and financially supported by Iran to then attack Israel. And then now within the last week, the Biden administration says we're, we're not going to put sanctions on Iran like Donald Trump did, and we're going to release another $10 billion dollars. That will also most likely go through Qatar. So it's like they just they keep feeding enemies money and courage and confidence. Uh, it, it just blows my mind. I, I can't wrap my head around it. Iran looks at the West and believes, not without good reason, that we lack the self-confidence as a civilization to continue fighting. What really is a small and corrupt and tyrannical regime, but which through its threats and its willingness to commit atrocious acts of terror has frightened the West. And we have allowed people who agree with some of these radical philosophies to come to our countries. It has to be said that the massive migration of Muslim immigrants from the Middle East to Europe and to the United States over the last two decades has had some political effects on our debate. And while most are simply hardworking, good, honest people, there are some who have arrived with completely unreconstructed views of the United States and Israel. They have been steeped in propaganda since the time they grew up in the countries they came from. And we're seeing the first generation of their kids arrive on college campuses in the United States, and they're driving a lot of the anti-Israel, anti-Semitic sentiment there. And because our academies are already very left wing, they don't know how to push back against it. 
They subscribe to some of the same post-colonial left-wing radical ideology. And so they're completely unable to defend their own institutions against this. And we need to rethink our immigration policies. We need to rethink our foreign policies. Most of all, we need to have confidence in our own beliefs and principles. You know, the kind of feeling you have in Israel watching this conflict unfold is one where Israelis are returning to faith, they're supporting one another, they're doing good deeds for one another. They're taking inspiration from Jewish tradition and from Jewish principles. They're undergoing a revival. And, and this has been going on actually since before the war. For the last several years, the birth rate in Israel has been increasing among Israeli Jews. This is unique in Western civilization. In the United States, our birth rate, which was high 20 years ago, has been collapsing. We don't have families anymore. We don't go to church anymore or synagogue. We don't believe in the future anymore. So we're not having families. We're not committing to anything. And Iran and China look at this. First of all, they feed some of it. I mean, I'm sure that a lot of the stuff that's coming to our kids over TikTok is reinforcing some of this move away from our own traditions and our own principles and even our own freedoms. You know, you don't have to be a traditional conservative to appreciate the freedom and and lowercase l liberalism that we enjoy in the west that's all being undermined by these totalitarian regimes china through its influence in social media and technology and iran through its threats and what israel has done is it's returned in some ways the last several weeks to its original founding ideology to a, spent, a spirit of unity and togetherness and and faith i mean one of the one of the items in greatest demand by soldiers at the front has been religious items. Soldiers have been asking for tzitzit, which are these um, undergarments. They're described in the Bible, but basically they're little fringes that are supposed to remind you of all the commandments in the Torah. And soldiers who are not religious have been asking for these to be made, usually in military green, so they can wear them as a statement of faith. So Israel is returning to faith as a reaction to being confronted by terrorism. And unfortunately, in the two decades since 9-11, many Americans have given up on the idea of God. And I think that it's having an effect on our culture and in our ability to resist a growing threat from the rest of the world. Okay. Wow. Uh, that, that's, uh, you know, it's, an, again, unfortunate that we've gone through this, but to see the aftermath, um, you know, what could come out of this is, is also interesting. Um, my understanding is that the hostage negotiations are, are starting now. They're starting to transfer people back and forth. Uh, Israel has agreed to release three people for every one of their people. Can you can you tell us more about those negotiations? So there has been an agreement for a four day pause in fighting. And in return, the Hamas terror organization is releasing at least 50 Israeli hostages, all women and children and the elderly, no men, certainly not men of fighting age, no soldiers, male or female. They're just going to release the, the most humanitarian of all the hostages, you could say, uh, the, the most vulnerable of all the hostages. Israel has agreed to release, you're right, three to one. They're releasing Palestinian terrorism convicts. These are people who have been convicted of terrorist offenses, like attempted murder. No one who's actually murdered Israelis is going to be allowed out of prison, but there are people who have participated in terrorist activities who are going to be released up to 150. There are little extenders in the deal where Hamas can buy itself another day of ceasefire or pause in fighting for every 10 hostages they release, additional to the 50. And that's going to last a maximum of 10 days. So you could see perhaps a maximum of about 100 or so, maybe a little bit more like 80 or so hostages released. But Israel has said it's going to continue fighting when this pause is over because one of the goals of the war, in addition to freeing the hostages, is to eliminate Hamas. Israel has decided it can no longer live alongside Hamas. It's too much of a threat. There was this idea before the war that Hamas, even though it's radical Islamic and terrorist, can be relied upon simply to mind its own affairs. It had been defeated in so many wars with Israel. Just leave it alone. We don't have to risk our troops or our civilians by going in on a ground war. That illusion has been shattered, and now Israel is determined to get rid of Hamas. The danger is that this pause in the fighting will give Hamas leverage to push the international community to demand a broader ceasefire that would end the war and leave Hamas in power. 
that would be a disaster. It would be a defeat for Israel. It would be a defeat for the United States. It would be a defeat for the West. It's exactly what Iran is hoping for. So Israel is going to continue to pursue this war. It, it is winning on the ground very easily. It's mopping up Hamas carefully, and it's taking care not to put civilians in harm's way. Hamas does put civilians in harm's way anyway, but the Israelis are being very careful. Unfortunately, there are going to be challenging days ahead when you start to hear voices around the world saying, you know, you've had a pause for several days. Why not just stop altogether? And Israel is going to have to stand up to that and say for its own survival and frankly, for the sake of the West, no, we need to eliminate this radical Islamic terror group, just like the United States eliminated ISIS. OK, fin final question, Joel, I appreciate you coming on. Um, the, the country of Turkey, their leader has called Israel a terrorist state now. There are leaders in Africa saying that Netanyahu is the actual terrorist, that he's committing war crimes. But but what is the feeling uh, about Benjamin Netanyahu within Israel itself? Netanyahu came into this conflict deeply unpopular in Israel, even though he won the last election a year ago. There were deep political divisions in Israel over his judicial reforms that his new conservative government wanted to introduce and, and did introduce. They, they did pass one or two of them. He came into this conflict very unpopular. People said that his agenda was dividing the country, and yet his government was holding together. So his coalition was supporting him, so he was politically stable, but he had a low approval rating. Then the war happened, and there are many Israelis who feel that because it happened on his watch, he should ultimately be held politically responsible for it. But there are very few Israelis who want to get into politics right now. Most of them are saying, let's put all this off, all the investigations, all the debates, let's put it off till after the war is won. So there's a degree of maturity that I've experienced in the Israeli body politic where people are saying, listen, let's win the war first and then we'll get to the consequences later. And that strikes me as a sign of Israel's strength, that they're not bickering with one another. I think Hamas, by the way, underestimated the cohesion of Israeli society. They looked at some of the divisions, some of the political debates, and they said, ah, Israel is divided, Netanyahu is weak. We're going to strike when they're weakest. And, and Netanyahu realized that could be a problem. In fact, during the protests of the previous several months, he repeatedly said, Israel's enemies should beware if you strike us now, if you try to take advantage of this moment now, we're going to strike back very hard. So he's done that. And I think also with the hostage agreement, he's managed to keep Israelis on board from the left, I think there was more sympathy for a hostage agreement on the left. Right-wing Israelis tend to feel, even though they want the hostages back as well, they tend to feel this is not an answer. You have to keep hammering Hamas. You have to beat them militarily. There's no way to negotiate with them. Don't give them breathing room. But he was basically able, so far, he's been able to keep both the left and the right on board. Certainly, he doesn't see himself as a terrorist. The Israelis don't see him as a terrorist. The Israelis believe that they are doing everything they can to reduce civilian casualties. They look at Hamas hiding out in hospitals. They look at Palestinians deliberately killing Israelis, taking children and grandparents hostage, raping women. And, you know, they, they look at this and they say, how can you possibly side with Hamas? And, and everything they're doing is within international law, uh, Israel is in, in, in Gaza. I mean, Yes, there's a lot of destruction. That is because Hamas has placed its infrastructure in civilian areas. Israel's being as careful as it can. And the Israeli people are, are carrying out this war. If Netanyahu said tomorrow, I want to stop the war, then you'd see political pressure to have him thrown out of office. The Israeli people want this war because sometimes, hard as it is for us to imagine from a position of relative comfort, sometimes war is the answer. When you're facing a Nazi-like threat, you can't accommodate it. You have to defeat it completely. And then you can move on and then you can have peace. But when someone is committed to your destruction, then you can only respond by defeating them. So I don't think there's any chance that Netanyahu would be ousted because of the war. He would be ousted if he didn't pursue the war. And then after the war, there may be political consequences as a result of the fact that the attack happened on October 7th. But for now, the Israelis are patient and they're willing to give him a chance to fight the war. They don't feel like they need a new leader in the middle of the war. There's a national unity government. Some of the opposition parties have joined the government. So everyone's basically united around winning. Okay, great. Uh, Joel Pollack, thank you so much for coming on and giving us your insight. I'll make sure to leave a link to your articles down below. I uh, hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, you too.